Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for Orthopod TV. And today we'll be talking once again remotely with Dr. Brett Fink. Dr. Fink is an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon who practices at the Community Health Network in Indianapolis, Indiana. Dr. Fink did his medical school training at Washington University in St. Louis, and from there an orthopedic residency at the Portsmouth Naval Hospital. He then completed two orthopedic foot and ankle fellowships, one at Boston University and the other at the University of Miami. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Fink. Thank you, Randall. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Dr. Fink, today what I thought we would discuss um, is a condition called midfoot arthritis. Now, I think that a lot of folks are wondering what exactly midfoot arthritis is. So why don't you begin by telling us, one, what arthritis is as it pertains to the foot, and the other um, thing about where in the midfoot we're talking about. Okay, um, well, arthritis is basically a wearing out of the cartilage. The normal covering that uh, is over the bones that allows the joints to move in a friction-free fashion uh, basically just wears off, a little bit like the brake pad on a car would wear off uh, and grind down and eventually the shoes would be grinding against one another and uh, of course on a car that would make a great deal of noise. In a uh, person when the cartilage wears off then the joint doesn't really work in a friction-free fashion and it really becomes quite painful uh, so that uh, when the motion is restricted, it, uh, it doesn't move easily, and it takes a great deal to get it started moving when, it, uh, when you do decide to move it. Uh, the joints that we're going to be talking about in the midfoot are, are joints that are very commonly affected with arthritis. Um, the specific name for these joints are the tarsal metatarsal joints and the navicular cuneiform joints. And these joints are found just above the arch uh, if you were to look down at your foot, they would be the part of your foot that is immediately forward the shin uh, and the ankle area, in between that and the ball of the foot. And when someone has midfoot arthritis, what sort of symptoms are they going to expect? Well, one of the first things that people will notice is that uh, a lot of times the joints in this area are lar enlarged. Sometimes this will present as a bump. Uh, in this area, and people will often wonder why they have a bump on top of their foot, especially right over where the laces come up over the top of the foot. Um, but like other forms of arthritis, the biggest problem is that they become very painful. Um, people may hurt every time they put weight on the ball of their foot, or they may hurt when they're on their foot for a long period of time. And do we have any idea what causes or what may predispose certain people to develop midfoot arthritis? Well, it's interesting. The, the joints of our body, almost any joint, are very resilient at, uh, uh, and very good at taking care of weight that is put directly across the joint. What happens with the midfoot and really with a lot of other forms of arthritis is that when the joints or the ligaments around the joints become damaged, uh, the pressure that is put across the joint can be uneven. And uh, when the pressure is uneven, the joints can wear out very quickly, um, such as if the joints in the middle part of the foot are even a little bit damaged by a sprain or a fracture, they can go on to develop arthritis. Although a lot of people are genetically predisposed to arthritis, um, and it may run in their family. Um, some of what causes the arthritis, in my opinion, is that um, as we get older, the muscles become weaker in, our, uh, in the bottom part of our foot. And these muscles are very important in trans or helping, our, helping the weight in the ball of the foot be transferred through these joints. And what happens is that when we lose the muscle conditioning, the uh, weight that's put across these joints becomes uneven and starts to really wear out the joints very quickly. And, and what about associated diseases? I think you did mention that you know it, it can come on with, with increased stress, so I'm assuming that perhaps obesity, being overweight, may, uh, may predispose you to having this condition. Any other medical conditions that are associated with midfoot arthritis? Well, anything that will um, Overload those joints is one way of uh, developing midfoot arthritis. And like you said, being overweight is one of those things. Uh, other conditions that can shift the weight from the heel to the forefoot uh, can cause it too. So that if you're 
Achilles tendon in the back of your ankle is uh, tight, the, uh, the weight can be shifted too early in your step onto the forefoot and it can overload those joints. Uh, a similar thing happens, although it's not quite as easy to describe, when the hamstrings are also tight. Um, any disease that can damage the ligaments, uh, any inflammatory process like rheumatoid arthritis or other less known forms of inflammatory arthritis such as uh, psoriatic arthritis, uh, anything that damage or causes the joints to become inflamed can loosen them enough to set in this process where the joints start to wear out. Uh, and once they start wearing out, unfortunately, there's very little that can be done to stop them from wearing out. You know, I think, I think a lot of folks are going to wonder what, what relationship this has to physical activity. Is this something that you see in people who are you know, long distance runners or people that really, I would say, abuse their feet um, from the standpoint of, of either staying on their feet a long time or doing things that really cause constant stress to the feet? Where are we on, on that? Well, really, there's no, there's no evidence that physical activity has much to do with midfoot arthritis. Now, if during that physical activity you were to develop an injury, that may cause midfoot arthritis. So if you uh, were involved in, in playing football as a, as a high schooler um, and you suddenly wrench that foot such that the lig ligaments were injured slightly, uh, that, can develop arthritis, that can cause you to develop arthritis even as a, a young or middle-aged adult. Um, as far as uh, you know, regular, normal physical activity, even uh, doing things like running a marathon uh, on a frequent basis, there's no evidence that that really causes the joints to deteriorate in any way. Um, so I, I wouldn't uh, have my listeners uh, worry that uh, if they exercise on a regular basis, that midfoot arthritis is something that they're going to be contending with. It really is, uh, I, you know, in my opinion, I think that um, a reasonable degree of physical activity is actually good for the cartilage in the joints as long as the foot is normal. Uh, unfortunately, once the foot becomes arthritic, it tends to wear out, and the faster that you uh, uh, wear those joints at that point, uh, the more they're, they're going to be um, uh, damaged. But that type of physical activity can actually condition the muscles in the middle part of the foot. And in, in my um, opinion, uh, that's protective of the joint. Well, I think that probably is like we see in lots of uh, different uh, conditions. You know, uh, as you point out, uh, exercise is probably in general not a bad thing. And our connective tissues are, are really geared towards slow stress adapting to that slow stress and actually becoming more helpful or he more healthy at that point. So sounds like this is one of those conditions uh, that shares that uh, attribute. And uh, let's talk a little bit about shoe wear because I think in all things that have to do with the foot, we're always worried about shoe wear. One is, is can shoe wear actually um, make this condition worse, or can shoe wear, improper shoe wear, actually cause this condition? Well, first of all, like, like I said before, and, and like we've talked about several times, I feel that shoe wear has very little to do with the development of midfoot arthritis. Um, if anything, I think protective of, or supportive shoe wear uh, probably causes the muscles not to be as conditioned and may actually encourages things like this. I'm not sure that it encourages midfoot arthritis, definitely, but other forms of pain, I think, are, are caused by, uh, in some degree, overly protective shoe wear. Now, that being said, I don't think that I would suggest any particular form of shoe wear to prevent midfoot arthritis. However, once you've developed midfoot arthritis, shoe wear can be very helpful to decrease the symptoms. Anything that protects the midfoot from um, too much force on the ball of the foot or, or, or keeps the midfoot from moving too much while you're walking, I think is going to decrease the, uh, the uh, pain from midfoot arthritis. So if you already have midfoot arthritis, an arch support can be very e helpful in helping you to deal with the pain and protect your foot from the types of activity that might cause it to become uncomfortable. 
Um, the other thing that can be helpful once you develop midfoot arthritis is a rocker sole shoe. The stiffer the shoe is, the less that it allows your foot to bend, the less that you're going to have pain from this midfoot arthritis and the less that the joint is going to be aggravated. But if you've got a mild amount of midfoot arthritis that doesn't really cause pain, and for some reason your doctor has gotten an x-ray and knows that you have midfoot arthritis, I would just uh, treat it as normally as possible, and I think that's going to, in the long run, help you um, keep your foot strong. Well, let's switch gears for a moment and talk a little bit about what brings patients to your office with this condition. You mentioned that it, it can cause a deformity, it can also cause pain. When patients show up in your office, why are they there? Well, almost always because of pain. Um, a, lot of times they, a lot of times they'll be told that they have a stress fracture, which um, midfoot arthritis and a stress fracture can be very difficult from a symptom standpoint to really differentiate. Um, sometimes they come in because they have a bump on the top of the foot, which becomes uncomfortable when they put laces over the top of it, and they want to know what this bump is because they may be worried that it's uh, cancer or tumor or some kind of growth that they need to, um, they need to do something about. Uh, but most of the time they come in because uh, if they're on their feet too long, it just hurts. Uh, and when I evaluate them, I, I'm, I'm looking to find out whether their pain seems to be localized to these joints, which would be more suggestive of midfoot arthritis, or whether it's actually in the bones themselves, which would be more typical of a stress fracture. And when you start the evaluation, can you go through what you're going to do on that first visit to try to get to the bottom of, of what the condition is and what the patient's uh, suffering from? Yes, and uh, usually um, that the workup at that point involves getting an x-ray. I usually check to see what these joints actually look like because uh, on occasion they can look fairly normal and just be aggravated. And that's, uh, and that's something that may go away um, over a short period of time. Um, but the x-rays often, if the joint is uh, advanced in its uh, deterioration, will show the uh, arthritis quite, uh, quite well. And you get plain x-rays, I'm assuming. Is there any need for any special tests like a CAT scan or an MRI scan or anything more advanced? Well, uh, I think that there is a, a, a place for those kind of uh, uh, tests when there's a question about what is going on. Um, if the x-ray doesn't just show that there's definite arthritis, then I think that, a, that those kind of tests, a, a bone scan or an MRI, may help you uh, decide whether there is um, a problem that may be a stress fracture, which would be treated very differently and have a different prognosis, of course. Um, CAT scans can sometimes show very subtle uh, types of midfoot arthritis. Uh, I will have to say that more than once, I've had patients sent to me because they were thought to have a stress fracture because they had swelling around the joints of the midfoot and it did turn out that they had midfoot arthritis. Uh, so uh, if you don't look at the studies carefully, it can be uh, kind of confusing, and uh, you need to make sure that it really looks like a stress fracture if it's being called that, because I, I, have, seen, um, I have seen these things overcalled and, and called um, stress fractures when it's actually midfoot arthritis. And I guess the take-home message here, though, is what I'm hearing you say is that, generally speaking, x-rays are going to be enough to confirm your initial um, conception that this is midfoot arthritis. And if you're concerned that maybe something else is going on or something different is going on, then you may go to these tests. But a patient shouldn't expect to have a CAT scan or an MRI scan probably on the first visit. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, it would be just in the very unusual case that I would find one of those studies to be necessary. Yeah. What about blood tests? Do you feel the need to get any type of laboratory blood test or anything else to, to evaluate this disease process? The only time that I would think of getting a blood test is if I was suspicious that there might be an infection or if I was working up someone to find out whether they had rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or one of those other common diseases that might be, uh, that might be causing this uh, type of arthritis. But in the majority of patients, I would say 90, 95% of them, uh, blood tests are unnecessary. 
And so once you've made your diagnosis and you're relatively certain that this patient that you're seeing is suffering from midfoot arthritis, how do you start the discussion about what the treatment options are? Where do you begin the treatment process? Well, like I said, my own belief is that, um, that conditioning the midfoot is very important. And so I usually start my patients on a series of stretching exercises to loosen up their Achilles tendon, to loosen their plantar fascia perhaps, um, and their hamstrings, uh, and also to uh, condition and strengthen the uh, small, uh, small muscles in their feet to help them support the, arch and, or support the midfoot joints and protect them as much as possible. If they're having a great deal of pain that's limiting their activities, then during those activities, I suggest that they use things like an arch support or a stiffer shoe, like a rocker sole shoe, to help with their discomfort. In some cases, I may even prescribe physical therapy to help them uh, uh, learn these exercises and get into a, a routine that they can do at home that might be healthy for their midfoot and preserve the joint as long as, it, as, long as possible. Um, when this, is, uh, when this uh, fails to relieve their symptoms, then on occasion we talk about surgical methods of treating this, which are, which are effective, but uh, more difficult. Now let's talk a little bit more about the shoe wear and the orthotics that you're going to prescribe. Are these things that patients can buy off the shelf, or do you have them see someone and have something special made or a special shoe created for this disease process? If the arch and the foot are, have maintained their structure fairly well, if they look normal, I think an over, a, a good over-the-counter arch support is, uh, can be very uh, helpful in this. I, I don't think, uh, for the most part, that a custom, more expensive arch support is really necessary unless the arch has begun to collapse, which is something that you see sometimes in midfoot arthritis. Um, as far as the rocker sole shoes are concerned, uh, most Better shoe stores will have a, a version of rocker sole shoe. There are several companies that kind of uh, specialize in this. Um, Skechers used to make a, quite an assortment of rocker sole shoes. There's a company called MBT um, that, uh, that also has a great a number of them. Dansko um, has a, a number of rocker sole shoes. So they are something that is uh, uh, fairly available if you, if you look in the right place. And what about medications? Do you tend to use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, the ibuprofen or naproxen type medications in this disease process? I think these medications are very helpful for symptoms, as is, uh, as is ice or heat or compressive wraps. All of these methods of treating it decrease the amount of pain that you're able to perceive. I don't think that they have any, any uh, effect at all at the long term. Um, outcome. So if you're looking for one of these medications to make you, um, to cure you, or to make your arthritis go away, then I don't think that you can expect that out of an anti-inflammatory. However, if you are uncomfortable and you need some pain relief, then anti-inflammatories can be a, fir a good first-line pain medication to help with, um, to help with the pain from midfoot arthritis. Um, other things that can be done, like I said, is to use a hot pack or a cold pack. What these, um, what these types of interventions do is basically stimulate the pain or inhibit the pain pathways from um, making your br brain perceive the pain. So that if you stimulate other nerves like cold nerves or nerves that sense heat or nerves that sense pressure or rubbing, all of these things uh, inhibit your brain's ability to perceive pain and therefore that makes it feel better. Uh, however, over the long term they have no effect on the, uh, on the deterioration of the joint at all. And what about injections? Do you ever consider cortisone injections into these joints that are uh, uh, quite arthritic? I use cortisone injections quite, quite a bit for this. It does give my patients, uh, in certain cases, pain relief that can last for uh, several months. However, once again, um, over the long run, I don't think that cortisone injections do much to cure arthritis. They don't help it slow down. Uh, what you can expect from a pain or, or a steroid injection is that you'll get, hopefully, um, 
three, four, six months of pain relief, and then the pain will gradually come back, usually. Um, now, if you don't aggravate the midfoot too much, perhaps the pain relief will be even longer. But uh, it, they are unfortunately not a cure, and some studies have indicated that they may actually damage the cartilage over the long run. But most of the patients that I'm injecting, their cartilage is already gone, so it's hard to say that you're really damaging their cartilage more. And is there any evidence to support the use of some of the agents that we inject into other joints like the knee and perhaps the hip and the shoulder, the visco-supplementation uh, uh, type chemicals that we're using in other joints? Anything to suggest that might work in the foot? Well, no one's ever done those studies, and I, I would have to say that even in the knee that uh, the evidence is a little sketchy. Um, certainly people seem to get pain relief from it, and I don't see any reason why people wouldn't get pain relief from those injections in the foot, uh, but uh, again, uh, they haven't been studied, and unfortunately a lot of insurance companies not, will not allow you to do that as one of the indications that they will pay for. Yeah, I'm probably, I guess I'm under the impression that that probably would be used as an off-label sort of indication um, if you tried to inject visco-supplementation agents into the foot. Is, is that your understanding? Yes, and you'd have to be very careful to get the medication into the joint uh, properly because these joints, especially when they're arthritic, can be very difficult to get a needle into. Um, and I'm not sure if you allowed this stuff to get into the soft tissues whether in, in the thinner midfoot it would be cause a problem. Well, let's talk a little bit about what our options are if this fails. If, if you've got a patient that you know, has gone through all the conservative care and still is having disabling pain, when do you switch and begin to talk about surgical indications and, and, and possibilities that surgery might be indicated? Right, and for midfoot arthritis, surgery is certainly a last resort. I, I'd have to say, of the patients that I see for midfoot arthritis, I, I may end up operating on them on five or ten percent of them. Really, it's uh, uh, even though midfoot arthritis is a very common diagnosis, it's pretty uncommon to actually have to get the operation for it. Um, and really, the workhorse for treatment of uh, midfoot arthritis, when all other methods of treating fail, is fusion, which means that you. Um, you open up the joint surgically, uh, you uh, remove the remaining cartilage and the bone that's directly, the hard bone that's directly underneath the cartilage, and then you may put some bone graft from another area that you've harvested from the knee or hip or pelvis and, uh, and place it in there. Use metal devices to hold the joints together in their proper position and then allow them to fuse a lot like a fracture would fuse. Um, this whole process is uh, unfortunately um, uncomfortable and it will take probably six to ten weeks for the, uh, um, for the fusion to actually take. And there is a five or ten percent chance that it won't take. And then you'd be left in the same place uh, that you were before and the operation may have to be redone. Um, but unfortunately there aren't any joint replacements like there are for the knee or the hip. Um, fusion is really the primary operation. That being said, on occasion when I have patients that have arthritis at several different levels in their foot, which is unfortunately somewhat common, um, a lot of times I have resorted to doing a gastroc lengthening, a loosening up of the Achilles tendon, and seeing if that might help with their discomfort. It's rarely complete, it rarely causes complete pain relief, but a lot of times it keeps you from having to do a more extensive operation in the foot. And a lot of my more elderly patients that may not want a, uh, a huge operation on their foot are satisfied with this and are able to go about their normal activities which mu with much less pain. Can you explain how that works? Um, by lengthening the gastroc or the Achilles tendon, I'm assuming, you're doing what in terms of the forces across the foot? How does it reduce pain? Well, the, the idea is, especially in a patient that already has a tight gastroc, is that you're loosening it. And what happens is that if the gastroc is tight, um, it will cause you to roll up onto the ball of your foot early in your step, 
and put a greater amount of force on the ball of the foot during your uh, uh, walk. And this is transferred through the midfoot during that portion of the gait. Um, when you loosen up the gastroc, it, it weakens the muscle slightly and shifts more of the weight from the forefoot onto the heel uh, throughout your gait cycle. And that decreases the amount of pain. Um, I find that, the, that this type of thing, an, an, an aquinas contracture or a tight Achilles tendon, is quite a common finding in people that have arthritis in several different levels along their midfoot. And do you find that that works similar to the rocker sole shoe? It seems like you could almost achieve the same effect with the rocker sole shoe or some type of um, uh, fancy orthotic. Is, is, it more, is, it, is it more effective than shoe modifications? Oh, I, I would say it's more effective uh, in terms of, uh, of, of approaching it kind of in the same way. Um, it, uh, it probably does approach it in a similar fashion. It's just that I would guess that a gastroc lengthening is probably a much more effective way of reducing uh, forefoot pressure uh, than uh, a rocker sole shoe. And gastroc lengthening has been used in several other things, including plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis. Um, a lot of what I would call the forefoot overload problems, um, which, are, um, uh, which are very, very common in my practice. And what you said, I think, if I can paraphrase, is that you know, the fusions take a long time to heal, so this is not something simple. It's not a simple procedure. Uh, it's something that patients need to be aware of, not only the severity of the, of the surgery, but also the length of the recovery period. Is, is, is that accurate, and am I hearing you correctly? Yes, I, I would say that unfortunately that, um, that a midfoot fusion is an operation that takes a long time to recover from. And when, when I say that it takes six to 10 weeks just to walk on it, that really is the first step towards recovery. I would guess that uh, most of the time when I'm doing a midfoot fusion, um, that it takes six to 10 weeks for them to first put weight on it, probably another six to six weeks before they are actually walking outside of a cast or a cast boot. And then it may take up six months to a year for them to completely recover from the operation so that they are feeling as good as they're going to feel. And I, I just want to go back to the Achilles tendon release. I don't believe that um, gastroc release is a good method of treating everyone with midfoot arthritis. I think that in certain elderly patients that have multiple areas of forefoot, ar forefoot and midfoot arthritis, that it can be quite helpful. But it is not, um, it is not a uh, treatment that is just for everyone. Well, one thing I think we ought to at least discuss a bit, and that's the, the complexity of the foot and what you do to the balance of all of those little joints in the foot once you fuse one joint that's arthritic. I think one of the things for years has always been a concern among surgeons of you fuse one joint and all of a sudden you've just transferred the the, the stress onto other joints and then you began this cascade effect where you begin to see acceleration of the arthritis and the degeneration in other joints. Is that something you worry about when you begin the process of trying to plan your, oper your operative intervention for these patients that may have multiple joints involved? Oh, it's something that I worry a great deal about. I, I think that that's, uh, that that's true anytime that you fuse any joint in the foot um, and really any joint in the body, is that uh, it's going to change the way that you use the other joints. Um, and like I said, uh, unfortunately some of the patients that I have that develop midfoot arthritis have a genetic predisposition towards arth arthritis, and therefore they are going to be much more sensitive to these changes, which is why, which is why um, fusion is really a last resort um, and why we try so hard to treat these non-operatively. Because like you said, even though these joints don't move very much, they still are critical in a fairly subtle way to the way that you walk. And if you fuse them, then it changes the way that you walk. And when you change the way that you walk, a lot of times the other joints begin to wear out quicker too. So I, I agree with you completely. It, uh, I kind of, uh, 
I kind of compare it to uh, an 18 wheeler truck. Um, an 18 wheeler truck has uh, really tires that hit the ground at all, uh, all the time. Uh, and when all 18 wheels are working properly, the wear is fairly even along the 18 wheeler. But when you begin to start um, popping some of those tires, then the pressure that from those tires gets shifted onto the remaining tires and then they fail more quickly too. So it can be kind of a cascading problem. So yes, I agree with you. It is a, it is very, uh, it's a very significant concern. Well, I like the 18-wheeler analogy. I've never heard that one, but that's a very good analogy that really points out the, the problem with balance. Let's, let's talk a little bit about complications. Probably no discussion of, of any type of surgery is, is complete without at least mentioning what might go wrong. Anything you worry about when you're doing surgery on the, on the midfoot that patients ought to be aware of? Uh, yes, and, and, there, and we could probably uh, spend this whole interview uh, talking about the complications that can occur. Um, First, first of all, are the complications uh, with the operation itself, of course, uh, anesthetic problems, um, infections, things like that. Um, the top of the foot has a very dense nerve supply, and really, I'm not sure that there is a, a square inch that doesn't have some fairly major named nerve that goes in it. So you've got to be very careful and plan your incisions to minimize the damage to these nerves, and I really feel that most people that have this operation have some degree of numbness on the top of their foot. Um, but you have to be very careful during your surgical dissection to ensure that the numbness and the damage to the nerves is minimized. Um, the operation itself is quite painful. Um, again, it is typical for people to require narcotic pain medications for some time. And when you take narcotic pain medications, um, you've got to worry about the side effects of, that they have. The most common ones are nausea, constipation, and itching. Uh, some of them require changing to different medicines. I often have my anesthesiologist um, put anesthetic blocks around the nerves to get my patients through the worst part of the pain uh, that is involved in fusion. Um, there are wound healing problems. Uh, in the process of trying to get to these um, joints, which unfortunately span a good portion of the, of the uh, top of the foot, you may stretch the skin to the point that, it may, that there may be parts of it that don't heal very well. And so wound, wounds are a problem on the top of the foot. Finally, um, if you get through all that, there is a possibility that the, um, that the fusion may not take. Uh, in which case um, you'll go on to what's called a non-union, which is when the fusion doesn't heal after four to six months. Um, while bone stimulators can be used to help with this, um, many times the operation has to be redone, and I would have to say that that is about five or ten percent of the uh, cases where, is where the operation needs to be redone. So fortunately, a small percentage. Unfortunately, if you're in that 5%, you're going to be very frustrated with the whole operation. Um, and then there are the concerns with making sure that the um, fusion is in the exact right place. If you twist the fusion, if you allow it to flex or extend, it, is a, um, it could cause problems, problems that may make it very uncomfortable to walk or may make it difficult to wear shoes or cause your joints to twist in a certain way. And this is something that, uh, that you really need to be a, a surgeon that's fairly experienced with this in order to address well. Well, I think this has been a, a comprehensive discussion of the, of the disease process of midfoot arthritis as well as the treatment options. Anything that you can think of that we haven't discussed up to this point as we come to a close and things that patients need to know we, we haven't covered? Um, I would have to say that, uh, again, that, uh, that, mid -foot, that early stages of midfoot arthritis are fairly effectively treated using shoe wear moderation, um, sometimes arch supports, uh, strengthening exercises, uh, and various non-operative ways of treating this. Um, typically, 
um, I'm able to get my patients through their uh, um, uh, through their whole life without uh, requiring further surgery. And surgery is probably rarely necessary, but uh, uh, in certain cases where the pain does not respond to non-operative treatment, um, can be very helpful. Um, that uh, that finding a um, an experienced podiatrist or orthopedist that uh, specializes in midfoot um, or in uh, uh, foot and ankle problems can be very helpful in, uh, in making sure that you're treated properly. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today for a great discussion. Look forward to additional discussions in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Randall.